Okay, so um, we're gonna get started. And for those that came in late, as I said, I have a lot to cover in two sessions. And so if I go over by the 45 minutes, just get up and leave and this is being podcast. So you can come back and um, So I'm starting out with a, a question. So which of the following is most likely to decrease uterine blood flow? And the answer is actually going to be D, paracervical block. So this leads us into the discussion of uterine blood flow. Now, remember, the uterus is not capable of autoregulation. So uterine perfusion, which then ultimately is going to relate to placental perfusion and fetal perfusion, is going to be dependent on having an adequate blood pressure having low uterine venous pressure and low uterine vascular resistance. And so in, in terms of decreased uterine placental perfusion, if you have a low uterine artery pressure, so mom is hypotensive, you'll have decreased perfusion. Increased uterine venous pr pressure is gonna be um, increased by vena cava compression. So one of the reasons why it's important that you don't let these women lie totally flat on their back by contractions, and that can be why when someone's hypertonic that you start to see abnormal fetal heart tracing is because of that increased uterine venous pressure. Um, the Valsalva maneuver during the second stage of labor also can increase your uterine venous pressure. And then in terms of increased uterine vascular resistance, uh, probably one of the most common causes of this would be preeclampsia being a disease of vasoconstriction, but also any sort of endogenous and exogenous vasoconstrictors. So if mom's in excruciating pain and has really high um, catecholamine levels, that can cause increased uterine vascular resistance. However, the 1 to 200,000 epinephrine that we have like in an epidural solution, that is actually going to cause vasodilation. It's not going to cause increased uterine vascular resistance and adversely affect your uterine placental perfusion. Very high concentrations of local anesthetic can cause increased uterine vascular resistance, and that is probably the etiology of um, the paracervical block decreasing uterine, um, uterine blood flow. Uh, choice of vasopressor, how does this affect it? So um, ephedrine has both alpha and beta effects. So in fact, you would say there's less increase in uterine vascular resistance compared to phenylephrine. So you might think this would be the preferred vasopressor. And in fact, in the past, um, back in my day when I was a resident and in my many year, years as an attending, it was the vasopressor of choice. However, more research has shown that um, Phenylephrine, although it does have a pure alpha effect, which means that it could increase your uterine vascular resistance, uh, you actually have a higher cord pH in infants when moms receive phenylephrine to treat hypotension as compared to ephedrine. And this relates not to the effect on uterine, um, uterine perfusion, but rather the effect on the fetus. There's minimal um, drug, the drug, not much drug passes over with phenylephrine to the baby, much higher uh, placental transfer of ephedrine than phenylephrine to the fetus, and that ephedrine essentially serves to rev up the metabolism of the fetus, and that is the etiology of um, the lower pH in the fetus. So it's not related to the, the um, uterine perfusion. Uh, maternal fetal drug transfer is another topic that I was supposed to cover. So um, what is going to affect placental transfer? Well, obviously, maternal concentration. The higher the concentration in the mother, more transfer to the baby. Um, the drug diffusion constant, which is going to be increased by low molecular weight, so low, small co compounds are going to cross more easily. Low protein binding, only the drugs that are unbound are going to cross, and that's why you'll see some local anesthetics have more um, crossing over than others because they are less highly protein bound than, say, bupivacaine. High lipid solubility, as well as those that um, have a low degree of ionization because only unionized drugs are going to cross the placenta. So those are all factors that will affect your maternal drug transfer. Um, also placental binding. So some of these drugs may bind within the placenta and some things will be metabolized significantly. For instance, um, a glucose is metabolized within the placenta itself. Oxygen is used within the placenta itself, so all the maternal oxygen isn't going to cross over to the baby. Um, and then anything that um, alters placental perfusion, so um, anything that really makes mom hypotensive, if she's hypovolemic, if she has aortic cable compression, or um, if you have vasoconstrictors on board, those can all alter your placental perfusion. Um, 
And then what about once the drugs get over to the fetus, what are effects within the fetus itself um, in terms of the drug concentration they are going to see? One thing to keep in mind is um, for many drugs in terms of metabolism, the fetus has immature pathways, so that will contribute to elevated drug levels. Uh, fetal protein binding, generally there's less protein binding capacity in the fetus compared to the mother. So you can see higher drug levels, especially for drugs that are traditionally highly protein bound. Those that do cross over to the baby, you will see higher drug concentrations in the fetus than in the mother because they have less capability for protein binding. And then fetal pH is another important one um, that will affect your um, fetal drug concentration. So we lead to another question. So a patient who's receiving epidural labor analgesia is taken to the OR for emergent C-section due to fetal bradycardia. Her epidural should be dosed with which local anesthetic? So if anyone wants to shout it out. C is 3% 2-chlorprocaine and that's related to uh, the fetal pH. Um, with most, with our other local anesthetics, we worry if you have fetal bradycardia, you expect that the baby is acidotic. So in the setting of an acidotic fetus, local anesthetic that crosses the placenta of the fetus is going to become ionized. And then it can't cross back to mother, so you will get an accumulation of the local anesthetic on the fetal side, which can lead, if the baby's delivered, to a floppy baby. So the reason that chloroprocaine is your drug of choice in fetal distress, besides the fact that it's very rapid onset, is that you don't have the issue of ion trapping because the maternal half-life of chloroprocaine is so short because it's metabolized so quickly on the maternal side that you get minimal drug transfer to the fetus. So that is why chloroprocaine would be the drug of choice. So the least amount of placental transfer will occur with which of the following anesthetic drugs? Anyone want to guess? C, succinylcholine, and that would be because your muscle relaxants are large molecules. So you see minimal drug transfer of your muscle relaxants because they are big. So essentially, drugs that don't cross the placenta in significant amounts are going to include, as I mentioned, your neuromuscular blocking drugs. Um, heparin is a large molecule and it's water soluble and remember lipid solubility increased drug transfer so there's no placental transfer with heparin. Um, insulin also is a large molecule with no placental transfer so those are probably important drugs to remember in terms of what won't cross the placenta. Um, sometimes there have been questions about bupivacaine and the maternal fetal distribution. Um, so as I mentioned uh, bupivacaine is highly protein bound within the mother um, and also it has a high PKA, so both of those factors limit the transfer to the fetus. However, this is one of those situations, though, that um, with the lesser degree of fetal binding, fetal protein binding, as a result of not having as much um, protein there for binding, that's going to lead to fetal concentrations of the free drug, which is what you're really interested in, equilibrating with the maternal concentration, despite the fact that there's not a lot of placental transfer of bupivacaine, that that is transferred, um, you'll have a total free fetal concentration that's less than maternal concentration, but your concentration of the active drug, the non-protein bound drug, will equilibrate between mother and baby. Um, other frequently asked questions relate to that of um, anticholinergics. Um, and the placental transfer of anticholinergics really directly correlates with the ability of these drugs to cross the blood-brain barrier. So if you can remember that, then you can remember um, the effects in terms of placental transfer to the fetus. Atropine easily crosses um, the placenta and can affect fetal heart rate. So if you give mom some atropine and you're monitoring fetal heart rate, don't be surprised if you see fetal tachycardia. Uh, scopolamine also easily crosses, but glycopyrrolate being that quaternary ammonium minimally crosses the placenta. So, uh, you know, if you had a choice between atropine and glycopyrrolate, if you wanted to bump mom's heart rate up a little bit, glycopyrrolate would be the, the drug that you would want to use. Uh, next, maternal fetal oxygen transport. So, placental oxygen transfer occurs via diffusion. So your transport is going to be determined primarily by the difference in PaO2 between the mother and the fetus. Um, there are some things to keep in mind. One is the Bohr effect. So as you have oxygen being delivered from nom, mom, to, mom to baby, you also have, going in the opposite direction, transfer of carbon dioxide from the fetus to the mother.
that's going to make the maternal fetal blood more acidic and the fetal blood more alkalotic, which will actually lead to a rightward shift of the maternal oxyhemoglobin globin dissociation curve and a leftward shift of the fetal curve. And so that's going to favor unloading of oxygen to the fetus. And really, the, the human body is, is pretty well designed in that uh, most things that are going to improve oxygen delivery to the baby, that's what's going to happen. So with the rightward shift in the mom, leftward shift in the baby, you're going to um, favor unloading of oxygen to the fetus as a result of carbon dioxide also being transferred back from baby to mom. Uh, fetal PL2 is never higher than about 50 to 60 millimeters mercury. Um, a main reason for this is, is that the placenta is a very active organ itself, and as I mentioned before, it has a high rate of oxygen consumption. So much of the oxygen that comes from the maternal side doesn't get to the baby because it's being used by the placenta. Um, another reason why the fetal PO2 never reaches more than 50 to 60 millimeters mercury is that your fetal arterial blood is actually a mixture of oxygenated umbilical venous blood as well as deoxygenated blood coming from the fetus, fetuses in pura vena cava. So uh, if you look at a, a cord blood gas, you know, you're not going to expect to see a PO2 of 100. A, a PO2 of 50, 60 is good. That means that that baby in utero was being well oxygenated. Um, I was also asked to talk about fetal hemoglobin and its effect on oxygen transport. So fetal oxygenation um, is going to depend on, as I mentioned, the maternal fetal oxygen gradient as well as the differences in the type of hemoglobin between mom and baby. So the baby um, hemoglo has hemoglobin F. Hemoglobin F has a greater affinity for oxygen and a lower affinity for 2,3-DPG. So this leads to a leftward shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. And so the P50 in the fetal blood is lower than the P50 in maternal blood. Um, and so the hemoglobin F and the higher hemoglobin concentration lead to fetal arterial blood oxygen concentration that's really just minimally lower than the adult. Although you have a lower oxygen tension, the actual oxygen consent, con, con, the action, concentration is, is not that much lower as a result of having hemoglobin F and a higher hemoglobin concentration. Um, maternal PaO2, how does that affect fetal oxygenation? You know, when we're in a C-section, we usually put oxygen on mom. When baby's starting to have D-cells on the labor and delivery floor, you see the nurse pop oxygen on the mother. Um, in fact, if you have a normal fetal PaO2, the increase in maternal FiO2 is really going to have only a slight effect on fetal PaO2. So in reality, if you're doing a C-section where you've got a normal baby, tracing's been looking okay, putting that oxygen on mom, we're really just doing that for ourselves. Um, it's really not going to significantly affect fetal PaO2. However, when you're in that labor room where mo baby's having D cells or fetal bradycardia and you see that the nurse puts oxygen on, then it really can be beneficial because if you're having fetal bradycardia, you expect that that's a sign of um, the fact that there's uh, fetal hypoxia. And so at a decreased fetal PaO2, if you increase mom's FiO2, this can be beneficial because in that range um, of that decreased fetal PL2, the fetal oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve is steep in that range. So upping FiO2 is going to improve oxygen delivery to the baby. So if you have a distressed baby, you'll get, with increasing mom's FiO2, you will get better oxygen delivery to the fetus. If you have a normal baby, it's really going to be minimal. Uh, next, I'm supposed to talk about fetal heart rate monitoring. So, okay, you know, the nurses on labor and delivery probably spend a couple of full days in this, but we're going to do this in about five minutes. Uh, so, which statement about fetal heart rate patterns is most likely true? So, anyone have an idea? So, the answer is actually D. So sustained fetal tachycardia can be indicative of fetal hypoxia. It's not the only reason for fetal, for fetal tachycardia, but it is one of the possible reasons that a baby is tachycardic. Um, early decelerations do not indicate fetal hypoxia. We'll talk about that. 
Um, certainly, as we already talked about, like with atropine, mom, drugs that you give to mom can affect fetal heart rate. And actually, beat-to-beat -beat variability is probably the, one of the most sensitive indicators of fetal well-being. So when you look at a fetal heart tracing, the things that you need to look at are what's the baseline fetal heart rate, what is the variability of that fetal heart rate? Sometimes you'll hear the nurses talking about it's, you know, it's flat, which is concerning. Periodic patterns, which is essentially the presence of decelerations and accelerations, as well as how that correlates to uterine activity. So generally, uh, baseline fetal heart rate normal is generally considered between 120 to 160. Over 160 is tachycardia, less than 120 is considered um, fetal bradycardia. So what's going to cause fetal tachycardia? So definitely chronic fetal asphyxia can cause fetal tachycardia. But you have to differentiate that from other reasons that wouldn't mean that you need to deliver the baby immediately. So if you have a mom who's febrile or septic, you can see fetal tachycardia. If you have a thyrotoxic toxic mom. Um, maternal drugs, so um, beta mimetic therapy. So if baby's been, if mom's been hypertonic and they give her some terbutaline to, to decrease the contractions because they're afraid baby is not tolerating all those contractions, that can cause fetal tachycardia. Uh, large doses of ephedrine, as I mentioned before, atropine can cause fetal tachycardia. So it can be a challenge to differentiate, but you need to know that one of the etiologies can be fetal hypoxia. Uh, what about fetal bradycardia? Um, primarily um, fetal asphyxia and fetal acidosis are going to be the primary etiologies of fetal bradycardia. Um, you can also, though, have local anesthetic toxicity from a paracervical block because what happens is if the, the obstetricians would do a paracervical block, they don't do them for labor because they can cause fetal bradycardia. But in fact, a paracervical block can give you adequate analgesia for the first stage of labor. But where they inject those large, cons large doses of local anesthetic, it's very near the fetus and you can get systemic significant fetal um, absorption of the local anesthetic, and that seems to be the reason for the bradycardia. Um, maternal beta blockers can re result in fetal bradycardia. There are case reports of stat C-sections done um, because of fetal bradycardia due to mom getting a pure beta blocker. And then congenital heart block is another one that you will see um, that can cause fetal bradycardia. Now, heart rate variability, beat to beat or short term variability, is the most sensitive indicator of fetal well being. So that, that's why the nurses are concerned when they see flat tracings, even if the heart rate is within the normal range. If there's no variability, that is a concern that there is fetal hypoxia going on. Long term variability is where you, it's not beat to beat, but over time it goes up and down. That's also another good indicator of fetal well being. It is not as sensitive as beat to beat variability, though. Um, and these are just some examples, um, normal fetal heart rate variability. Um, if it were flatter, that would not be good. So what causes decreased beat-to-beat -beat variability? Well, the reason that we're concerned about it is that um, one of the most common etiologies is fetal hypoxia and acidosis. However, you have to realize there are other things, including things that we do as anesthesiologists that can affect your variability, and you want to be able to differentiate. And in fact, if you have a concerning tracing, some of these drugs like opioids, you know, I would not give a fentanyl bolus to the epidural if the obstetricians have been talking about concerns about the fetal tracing, because then if the tracing goes flat, the question becomes, is it because the baby's not doing well, or is it because of the, the fentanyl bolus that I just gave mom? Um, our other anesthetics, um, volatile anesthetics, benzodiazepines, um, they can all um, decrease your beat-to-beat -beat variability. So for instance, if you're doing intraoperative monitoring in an anesthetized mother, um, you really can't comment under general anesthesia on, on variability. You really can only look for um, changes in fetal heart rate and the presence of decelerations. But if you lose your variability, it's very likely because of your anesthetic. Um, so those are things to keep in mind. And finally, um, fetal sleep cycle. So sometimes you'll see the obstetricians doing things like fetal scalp stimulation if there is decreased variability to see if they can wake up the baby, that that's not the reason that there's decreased variability. So in terms of the periodic patterns that you're looking for, accelerations um, are when you s see an increase of at least 15 beats per minute with either fetal movement or with uterine contractions. Um, and the presence of accelerations is good. That's reassuring. 
decelerations, you have early variable and late decelerations. Early decelerations are going to essentially mirror the contraction. One thing that helps differentiate them from maybe a variable is that they generally are not deep. You won't see the heart rate drop below 100 beats per minute. Um, variables are as, as described. They vary from contraction to contraction. One time they may be really deep, the next time they're not. They may be long, they may be short. Um, oftentimes you'll see the heart rate drop below 100 in that case. And then late decelerations, they're called lates because the deceleration doesn't start until after the peak of the contraction. Um, and again, they don't drop down a lot. Generally, your heart rate will be stay above 100, but late decelerations are the most concerning, even though they are not deep decelerations. So here's an example of an early deceleration here and here, mirroring the contraction. Variables, as you can see, with each one, they differ a little bit. And then finally, late deceleration. So as you can see, if you take and go up there, it starts down after the peak of the contraction. Those look kind of subtle, but even when they're small decelerations, if they are late, that is a sign of utero inadequate utero placental perfusion. So sometimes on boards, they, you know, they're not just going to ask you to identify, of course, the type of deceleration. It's more like why, why are they having this deceleration? So early decelerations generally is a vagal reflex that results from head compression during contractions. It's, it's not concerning. It really doesn't require any sort of special treatment at all. You don't even need to put oxygen on. Variable decelerations are also a vagal response, um, but a vagal response usually to umbilical cord compression. Um, and so if that continues with each contraction, you're compressing the cord every time, you'll reach a point where the baby loses its reserve and then you um, may actually see fetal bradycardia. So if you have deep variables with every contraction, that is going to be concerning. Now, during late labor, when mom's getting ready to push the baby out, you can also have a vagal response leading to variable decelerations due to intense dural stimulation from that fetal head compression. Um, and if baby's going to deliver soon, that's not a problem. Sometimes the occurrence, or they start having these variable D cells, can be a sign that they're now complete and ready to push that baby out. But if you're seeing variables other than right at the end of labor, and they're occurring with every contraction, then that is going to be concerning. Um, sorry, I said that. Late decelerations, essentially, even though they're, they may not be deep, they are concerning because they are a sign of inadequate utero placental perfusion. Um, so how are you going to manage this? Well, first thing you're going to do is in utero resuscitation. So that's where you see the nurse putting oxygen on the mom, making sure she's not lying flat on her back, checking her blood pressure. If her blood pressure has dropped from your epidural, treating that blood pressure, giving a fluid bolus to, to treat that blood pressure also. So that is going to be your initial management. But if late decelerations continue on with all these attempts, that is going to be a sign that you're going to need to proceed to delivery, which if she's not ready to push the baby out is going to be an emergent cesarean delivery. Now, we talked about all the decelerations. Currently now, you will see the obstetricians, though, talking primarily about categories of tracings. So I could spend a whole lot of time about this. But what you need to know, there's category one, category two, and category three. So category one tracing is essentially a normal tracing. It's strongly predictive that at this point in time, this baby has normal fetal acid base status. Uh, category two is what a good number of tracings are. And unfortunately, they're sort of indeterminate. They really can't predict that you've got any abnormal fetal acid base status, but you also can't be reassured that you have normal fetal acid base status. So it's kind of like that gray zone, and that's what you really don't like because it makes decision making difficult. And then in category three, is uh, this is an abnormal tracing. It is predictive of abnormal fetal acid base status um, and requires prompt evaluation. Maybe sometimes they'll do some in utero resuscitation, it gets better. But if they have a category three and it doesn't get better, this is another one where you're going to be proceeding for an urgent C-section due to that concerning tracing. So let's talk just a little bit about umbilical cord blood gas analysis. So which one is most likely to be associated with adverse neonatal outcome? Um, is it going to be respiratory alkalemia, respiratory acidemia, umbilical artery, mixed acidemia, or umbilical vein, respiratory acidemia? Anyone? 
So first of all, you know you can narrow it down that it's going to be one of the umbilical arteries because umbilical artery is predictive of the fetal status, umbilical vein is predictive more of maternal and placental status. And so it's going to be a mixed acidemia because it's really the metabolic acidosis that you're concerned about. Um, so mixed as, um, a metabolic acidemia or a mixed acidemia are predictive of um, poor fetal outcome. Respiratory acidemia is generally not a problem and alkalemia is not a problem. And, and just to be aware of what's sort of a normal umbilical vein and umbilical artery um, cord gases, those are examples there. Um, and so to determine what type of acidemia you have, you need to look at your bicarb and your PCO2 base deficit. So the ones you're concerned about are the metabolics where if you look at the gas, there's a normal PCO2 but the bicarb is low and the base deficit is high or a mixed acidemia where you do have a high PCO2, but you also have signs of metabolic acidemia with a low bicarb and a high base deficit. Those are the ones you're concerned about. The gases that come back where you have um, an acidemia with a high PCO2, but your bicarb, your base deficit are normal, those babies are gonna do fine. That, that's not gonna be a problem. Now we're gonna talk about physiologic changes of pregnancy. Um, so when is the cardiac output of a parturion at its highest level? Anyone? B, immediately postpartum, that's correct. You have um, as, as much as, um, this got put in the wrong place, sorry. Um, but anyway, yes, cardiac output is increased. I got, this one was added in. This is one of the new topics, I guess, from last year, so I had to put this in. We're supposed to go right above the umbilical gas. It's talking about fetus, not into physiology. Anyway, so the thing to know about meconium stained amniotic fluid, there has been a progression over many years of how to treat this. So what is recommended now? It is no longer recommended that you do routine suction of the fetus, of the baby with meconium stained amniotic fluid, even if it's non-vigorous. Used to be you suctioned everyone. Then it was, well, if they're vigorous, you leave them alone. You suction those that are not vigorous. Now, you do not do routine suctioning of any of these babies. For a vigorous infant, it's just routine neonatal care. If you have a non-vigorous infant, essentially you treat that infant like any other non-vigorous infant, even if they didn't have meconium, which means that you use the usual same resuscitation guidelines. Um, you know, stimulate, um, bag mask if you need to. You only intubate and suction if you feel that there's actual airway obstruction from that meconium. Um, so you do not need to, it used to be if you had a non-vigorous baby with meconium, before you tried to bag that baby, every single one of them you were supposed to intubate and put the suction aspirator on and suction out. That's not the case anymore. You don't intubate and suction all these infants only if you truly think there's some sort of obstruction from that meconium. Uh, this was another question, I guess, that was added on from this year, neonatomyasthenia gravis. Things to remember about this is that the maternal antibodies, if a mom has myasthenia gravis, those maternal antibodies that she has to acetylcholine receptors will cross the placenta. So about 15 to 20% of babies whose moms have myasthenia gravis will have neonatal myasthenia gravis. Um, and they will develop symptoms within four days of delivery and they're gonna have feeding problems, they're gonna be hypotonic, they may have some respiratory difficulties. Um, usually as those antibodies leave, the baby's not making their own antibodies, they'll get better in about two to four weeks um, as those antibodies metabolize. However, during that time until those antibodies have gone, the baby may actually need to be treated with anticholinesterase therapy. So that's in there now. Now we'll go on to physi more physiologic changes of pregnancy. So another question. Which of the following is most likely to represent an abnormal finding in a woman at 38 weeks gestation? So it's actually going to be a pulmonary artery occlusion pressure of 22. So your central pressures should be normal in pregnant women. If they're not, there's something abnormal about it. All these others mild tricuspid regurg, uh, that's common to see in preg pregnant women. Um, all these others are related to physiologic changes of pregnancy. So to review these sorts of changes, cardiovascular changes, cardiac output, it increases throughout pregnancy. By the third trimester of pregnancy, you have an increase of about 30, per, about 50 percent overall of your cardiac output, due predominantly from an increase in stroke volume, although there is also a small increase in heart rate. 
And then during labor and delivery, you see an even greater increase. And that is why labor and delivery is a very fraught time for any woman who has underlying cardiac disease because they're further stressed. During the active phase of labor, you see about another 30% increase in, in cardiac output. During the second stage when they're pushing, about another 45%. And then, as that one question said, immediately postpartum, where you have the uterine involution and autotransfusion, you see as much as an 80% increase in cardiac output, above and beyond the usual 50% that occurs just because of pregnancy. Um, blood volume has increased significantly by about 35% during pregnancy, due primarily to increased plasma volume. Um, SVR decreases by about 20%, which can lead, at least during the first trimester, to mild decreases in blood pressure. As I mentioned in that question, your central pressures, though, are unchanged. You might think with that increase in blood volume that you would see an increase in your central pressures, but you also have dilation of vessels, and that is why you don't see an increase. Uh, which of the following is most likely to be decreased in a healthy woman at 36 weeks? And that answer is going to be your serum creatinine level. Um, in terms of respiratory changes, minute ventilation is also increased um, up to 50% at term, primarily due to increases in tidal volume. Again, you may see small increases in respiratory rate. Um, lung volumes and capacities, your, um, your ERV and your RV are going to be decreased. Um, inspiratory residual value will be slightly increased. FRC is decreased by about 20%, and this is in someone who is sitting up. And that's due primarily to your decreases in both your um, expiratory reserve volume and your residual volume. If you lay the person flat, like they go back for C-section, you'll see a further decrease in FRC. And if, like many of our patients, they are obese, you, that sort of additive, you'll see a further decrease in FRC. Um, and that decrease in FRC is a major reason why when you make a pregnant woman apneic, she becomes hypoxemic more quickly than a, than a normal patient. Your, your total lung capacity and vital capacity are unchanged in pregnancy. Oxygen consumption, just think of, you know, it's, it's a stressful thing to the body, so increases by about 20% during pregnancy and then during labor. Uh, just like when you're laboring in anything else, you're using more oxygen, so about 100% increase during labor. So the increased oxygen consumption also contributes to the, the fact that these women desaturate more quickly. Um, in, in terms of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, in a normal pregnant woman, there's a rightward shift, um, so that facilitates oxygen delivery to the fetus. Be aware that in a preeclamptic patient, it shifts back to the left, so that it's back, usually in preeclamptic women, it's going to be more like what would be your oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve in a normal non-pregnant patient, and so that interferes with oxygen delivery in that case. Um, what is a normal arterial blood gas in a non-laboring parturient in the upright position? Anyone? So it's actually going to be, um, <coughs> it's going to be D because your PaCO2, because of that increase in, um, in um, <coughs> minute ventilation, you have a decrease in your PaCO2, so it's going to be around 30, 26 to 32. Um, but there is metabolic compensation for that, so that um, you will see a decrease in your serum bicarb also to about 18 to 22. So you do get a very a small respiratory alkalosis, so you're not going to have an absolutely normal pH. It's going to be about 7.44. You can see a small increase in PaO2, but the thing to remember is that you should see a uh, slightly elevated pH, and PaCO2 is going to be around 30. It's going to be significantly lower than in a non-pregnant patient, but um, you're going to see a small decrease in your bicarb. So that is what you're looking for in terms of what is a normal pH. And beware, like if someone's asthmatic, then you need to realize when you start talking about normalizing their CO2 and they're probably getting on the edge, it's not when their CO2 is 40. When their CO2 is 40, they're already retaining CO2. It's when their CO2 is 30 that they're starting to normalize their CO2. GI changes. Um, um, progesterone is increased, and that leads to reduced lower esophageal sphincter tone. Also, as someone gets more and more pregnant, there's mechanical changes from the cephalad displacement of the stomach. So you have increased intergrastic pressure. Um, it also distorts the GE junction, which contributes to the gastric reflux that women have. 
So essentially, the clinical implications of GI changes are that we do consider these women to be at higher risk for aspiration than a non-pregnant patient. In terms of hematologic changes, um, I think we all remember there's the, the dilutional anemia of pregnancy. They have a, a normal hematocrit. It's going to be around 35 instead of around 40. Um, but do remember that that doesn't mean you have a decrease in red cell mass. You actually have an increase in red cell mass, too, but it's dilutional. You have a greater increase in plasma volume. So that's why you see the anemia, despite the fact that you have an increase in your red cell mass. And then hypercoagulable state of pregnancy. We talked about, you know, the TXA and such the other day in Journal Club. Um, but it is a hypercoagulable state, and, and pulmonary embolism is a leading cause of maternal mortality as a result of that. In terms of your CNS changes, the math of your volatile anesthetics decreases um, during pregnancy, as does local anesthetic um, requirements in that the nerves are more sensitive. Does that mean when I do a peripheral nerve block, I'm going to decrease the amount of local anesthetic I use? No, I don't think so, because you want to make sure you have an adequate block and you can't predict in each individual patient, so um, I wouldn't do that. Um, the reason for the, the changes in the MAC is that um, during pregnancy, there are increased endorphin and encephalin levels. That's sort of a uh, physiologic way to help women deal with the pain of labor. And they have an elevated pain threshold as a result of pregnancy, but those increased endorphin and encephalin levels will have a sedative effect at the CNS, and that's why your, your MAC is decreased. Um, renal changes, you have a significant increase in GFR, creatinine clearance is increased, and that is why is that question asked. A normal creatinine in a pregnant patient is 0.5 to 0.6. So if you have a patient who with severe preeclampsia and you're concerned about maybe having some um, renal insufficiency as a result of that, if they have a creatinine of 1 that's abnormal, they probably do have some renal dysfunction. Um, all right, now we're moving on to labor analgesia. A woman in active labor at 5 centimeters is having pain. Which of the following is most likely responsible for her pain? So it's actually going to be the stretching of the cervix. That is really what is the etiology of your pain. Uh, which of the following anesthetic techniques is least likely to provide adequate analgesia for the first stage of labor? Anyone? It's going to be a pudendo nerve block. A pudendo can be used to help with the second stage of labor with the somatic pain that occurs as the fetal head descends, but it's not going to take care of that uh, the labor contraction. Uh, when compared to IV opioids, epidural labor analgesia is most likely associated with which of the following? And it's actually an increased incidence of maternal fever. There is an association between increased maternal temperature and epidural analgesia. So in terms of labor pain, the first stage of labor is a visceral pain that's caused by that cervical dilation. The pain pathways to the uterus. Um, accompany sympathetic nerves T10 to L1. So if during first stage, if you put an epidural in, you want a level that goes at least to T10 down to L1 um, to get adequate analgesia. During the second stage, you now also have the somatic pain from that, that fetal head descending and stretching the perineum. Um, that pain pathway is via the pudendal nerve, which is derived from the S2 to S4 nerve roots, so you would want to block during second stage that goes from T10 to S4 to have adequate analgesia. And this is just a nice little table that shows you different techniques and what they will cover in terms of early or late first stage of labor and second stage of labor. So you can see um, a combined spinal epidural and epidural um, will take you across all of those. So that's something to keep in mind. It might be a trick question on the boards. A lumbar sympathetic block can actually give you pain relief for the first stage of labor. A paracervical block, we've already talked a little bit about how that affects fetal heart tracing, so be aware of that. Other adverse effects, hypotension, prolongation of labor. Not um, Generally, if you look at the studies, if you have an epidural in place, it can prolong your first stage, second stage of labor about 15 minutes. Some studies will also say the first stage of labor is prolonged by about 45 minutes. Other meta-analyses will tell you that only the second stage of labor is prolonged. And then, as I mentioned, the increased maternal temperature. And then finally, um, non-obstetric surgery during pregnancy. Um, which of the following best reflects the ASA statement on that? The answer would be that um, if possible, surgery is best performed in the second trimester. Uh, special considerations, you got to still think about physiologic changes of pregnancy during that. Teratogenicity of drugs, doing things, maintaining neural placental perfusion, so avoiding hypotension, keeping mom tilted if possible, and then preventing premature labor, especially if they're during the third trimester. Um, in terms of 
teratogenicity. Uh, chronic use of valine has been associated with fetal anomalies, and that's why they tell you to stay away from benzodiazepines. But a small dose, um, if you need anxiolysis or something, a Versed has not been shown to be a problem. I just avoid it unless I really need it, though, just for the medical legal reasons. Nitrous oxide has been controversial. There's really no good data to confirm the thoughts that it might be teratogenetic or increased fetal losses. Um, the reality is there's been, there's no data to support that any one specific anesthetic technique is going to improve fetal outcome. Um, regional anesthesia is often preferred if it can be done, but mostly um, for maternal reasons, that you avoid the risks of general anesthesia that you see in the pregnant patient due to um, difficult airway um, aspiration. And it does minimize drug exposure to the fetus. Of course, you, even though none of these drugs have really been shown to be bad, there's not a lot of data. So if you can minimize what drugs the, the fetus is exposed to, go, that's the best thing to do. After 20 weeks, you, you can have some aortic cable compression, so you want to have left uterine displacement. Um, you want to avoid maternal hypercapnia because it can cause fetal acidosis, but you also want to avoid maternal hyperventilation because if you get a maternal alkalosis, that can lead to uterine artery vasoconstriction and adversely affect perfusion to the fetus also. Um, we mentioned already in terms of fetal heart rate tracing that all you really can talk about is your baseline fetal heart rate and whether or not there's decelerations present. Um, there are concerns about um, precipitating preterm labor when you do surgery in a, not, in a pregnant patient, um, especially if the surgery is being done during the third trimester or if it's being performed in the pelvic or abdominal regions. Um, and what you can do for that sometimes is um, they may do some sort of tocolytic, maybe endomethacin. I've occasionally had cases where they've run mag during a case. Um, anesthesia for cerclage was one of the um, key words I was supposed to cover. Usually performed with a neuraxial anesthetic. Essentially, you need about a T10 to S4 sensory level. Generally, you're going to try to avoid any sort of anxiolytic drugs. And um, I actually got done in less than 45 minutes, despite the fact that I had over 60 slides. So, all right, thanks everyone.